for um, employees uh, to help with their housing needs. And we did this in concert, or we had it double checked by HSID, thank you Rushmore, um, to make sure that we had included all the key programs. And eligibility for employees, you know, as was stated this morning, can begin as low as, you know, as high as $54,000. So it's not like you may not have a lot of employees that would be eligible for housing assistance. So uh, we also want to say uh, thank you to some of our premier sponsors today. Bank of America has been consistent, California Community Foundation, the Energy Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase, the Gilbert Foundation, and Wells Fargo ha have all supported, as you heard today, the 17 years in which uh, the LABC is, has been hosting this summit here at UCLA, and we really appreciate uh, their support. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> I also want to make sure we acknowledge the LABC staff that are standing around. Just raise your hands. You know, they've worked really hard on this event. Yeah, you see Devin and Leilani, and you see Candace. Yeah, this was a lot of work, and we thank you. But now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Nancy Sutley, who really needs no introduction, our Chief Sustainability Officer uh, at, L at LA Department of Water and Power. And she will be heading up a panel entitled, Will Electrifying Vehicles and Buildings Help Us Reach Our Climate Goals and Spur Economic Development? Nancy. Is that better? Oh, finally. Phew. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody, and thanks to LABC, to Mary and the whole staff for uh, having me here as the moderator. I'm very excited about our fantastic panel uh, to talk about the role that electric vehicles and buildings can play in a clean and prosperous future for Los Angeles. So they have the potential, really, to transform Los Angeles you know, as you know, in spite of decades of amazing progress, we still have the most polluted air in the nation. And if we needed a reminder, this summer we had 87 consecutive days of unhealthy air. So coupled with our ambitious decarbonization goals, we still have a lot of work to do. And transportation accounts for more than 80% of the smog-forming pollutants in Los Angeles and more than half of the carbon emissions statewide. And building energy use accounts for much of the rest of both of those pollutants. And as our electric grid gets cleaner and cleaner with more and more renewable energy, and as car makers introduce uh, dozens of electric vehicle models, uh, everything from the VW micro minibus um, for all the hippies in the room, to a Porsche and a Tesla and everything in between, electrification of vehicles and buildings looks more and more like an essential strategy to meet our environmental goals, an economic winner for Los Angeles, and an opportunity to lead the nation and perhaps the world. And um, since I have the microphone, I would just put a little plug, sorry for the pun, uh, for LADWP, and we're going big on transportation electrification. We offer lots of rebates and incentives for electric vehicle chargers and other things to help electrification or helping our colleagues at the port, um, transit agencies in the city go electric. And, uh, and on the building side, for those of you who don't know, our headquarters building, the John Ferraro building, 
uh, which was built in 19, what opened in 1965, is an all-electric building um, and has always been an all-electric building. So uh, hopefully we can continue to, to show the way. So um, we have a great panel here to talk about lots of exciting things going on in this area. There are full um, bios are in your program, but let me introduce our great panel. First, uh, let's see. Oh, we everybody's sitting in different order. Okay, uh, uh, sitting right next to me as uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was very I was very excited to be here. <laughs> There's somebody to rescue the water here. Okay, I'm giving up. <laughs> okay. Uh, is the Honorable Laura Friedman, uh, who represents uh, Glendale, Burbank, and parts of the city of Los Angeles in the State Assembly. We're very excited to have her here. She's part of the Assembly uh, leadership team and has really been, in her time in the legislature, a, a ter terrific leader on all these issues. Uh, sitting next to her is Michael Backstrom, is the Managing Director for Energy and Environmental Policy at Southern California Edison. Did I get that right? More or less? Okay. Uh, <laughs> and he's helping to lead Southern California Edison's electrification efforts. Uh, and next to him is Chris Cannon, who's the Director of Environmental Management and Chief Sustainability Officer uh, at the Port of Los Angeles. And he is helping to move, uh, move along the uh, ports, both ports' uh, ambitious clean air action plan. And then, of course, next to him is Matt Peterson, the president and CEO of the LA Clean Tech Incubator, and uh, as you know, former chief sustainability officer for the city of Los Angeles. And he's going to talk about some exciting uh, transportation initiatives at the Clean Tech Incubator. And, and last, and certainly not least, um, Jonathan Port, the CEO of Permacity Solar, uh, one of LA's leading um, solar energy firms uh, with who have more than 100 megawatts of solar projects and probably more by now completed and uh, we are just excited to have you here. So uh, I'm going to uh, ask everybody a sort of an opening question and then we'll, um, if we have some time, we'll, we'll launch into a couple others and see if we can get um, folks uh, thinking about and talking to each other about some of these exciting developments. <coughs> so let me start with you. Um, Assemblywoman Friedman, you uh, had the governor, uh, you passed and had the governor sign uh, AB 3232, a very exciting bill that calls for the state to develop a plan uh, for new and existing building that gets us on the pathway to achieve our 40% greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, by 2030. So t talk to us about what, what motivated you to, to put that bill um, in and sort of what you expect to get out of it and how do you think that's going to affect our building stock? Sure. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Well, first, I'm very happy to be here and I do want to take a second just to introduce my team because I do work as a team. First, James Metropolis, who's my Sacramento-based legislative director who worked very hard on this bill. And also Seamus, <laughs> and Seamus Garrity, who works on transportation and housing issues here in my district office. Um, so the, the reason that we introduced AB 3232 is because there hasn't really been a statewide a, a comprehensive effort to address emissions from buildings. Um, as we become cleaner with our electrical generation side, we have to look at other big emitters of greenhouse gases, and buildings um, are either your second or th your third largest emitter of greenhouse gases, depending on how you calculate it. And because about half of our residential stock and about 40% of our commercial stock was built before 1978 when there were building efficiency rules, we have a lot of inefficient buildings. And primarily it's you know, heating and cooling from natural gas that's causing these emissions. There's other um, causality as well. But this is the first time the state's going to now have a, a procedure and a study looking at the emissions from buildings and how to reduce those emissions. And it, uh, we think it's very important, especially not just considering our more and more aggressive climate goals and the immediacy and the importance of reducing those emissions, not just for clean air, because, even though that's important, <coughs> but so that we can stay on track for our climate goals and do the most we can be, um, to push back on climate change, which is having such a huge impact already statewide and worldwide. Um, but also because as we move towards electrification of our auto um, industry, for instance, we have to understand how electrification is increasing the load at different times on our power structure and how that figures in with 
with um, energy in buildings. So this procedure will, and study will look at all of that in a comprehensive way with an eye towards reducing those emissions over time. We didn't see any real comprehensive work being done in the space and that's why we introduced the legislation. Well, thanks. Maybe I'll just ask a quick follow-up and the, the uh, preface of the, um, you know, this, uh, m many folks in this crowd are uh, building owners or real estate developers and I think they'll be wondering, okay, what does this mean for them? Are they, what are they going to have to do? How are they mm -hmm. going to pay for it? And uh, I'll give everybody a hint. Part of the answer is uh, we offer a lot of rebates and incentives, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as does Southern California Edison for yeah. building owners uh, who want to upgrade their buildings uh, and make them more efficient. But anyway. I'd say DWP offers a lot of uh, rebates. <laughs> 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 but look, I mean, a, a more and more building owners are making their build buildings efficient, not because they, just because they care about climate change, but because it pencils out in the long run, right? If you're reducing your electricity costs by putting in solar, and as those prices go down, um, you realize that it makes a lot of sense to do it. And I, I, I only own a home. But even looking at things in my own home, like a flash water heater, you know, which affects so much. Right now, I've got to run the tap in my kitchen for at least seven minutes to get hot water. And water is increasingly expensive. So I can tie that cost of the water to the cost of the flash water heater to the cost of electricity and realize that being efficient in water and in power saves me money as a homeowner. Um, so as we make our, our property owners and even our renters, and we, as we educate them as to the benefit of that, more and more people are taking it upon themselves. But it's also important for the state to send those market signals. So sometimes you need that stick of regulation because then you can, you can push the industries that develop the technology into working hard to develop new technologies. With the economy of scale, the prices start to come down. So all of that is important to, to look at. The education, the rebates, the market signals, the regulation to then bring everyone in line so that you can bring cheaper products and more products to market uh, and again with the goal towards being efficient and hitting all of our climate goals. Well, thanks and, and for those of you who are interested our rebates information about our rebates is available at www.ladwp.com. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Assemblywoman, let me move on to Michael. Um, so you know the governor uh, has laid out a goal of having five million EVs on the road by 2030 to meet our greenhouse gas reduction targets and Southern California Edison has laid out a bold plan for uh, the electric grid uh, to be supplied 80% carbon free energy although I think uh, after SB 100 was passed and signed you guys may need to update <laughs> that one a little bit um, but using and also using electricity to power uh, nearly one third of space and water heaters in uh, en energy efficient buildings and more than uh, and you project more than 7 million electric vehicles on California ro roads all by 2030. So how are we going to get there? Because um, we really want to know. Hmm. Um, I, I would actually love to pick up on the uh, Assemblywoman's theme of talking about and thinking about these things in a holistic way. Um, and that's really what we did when we set out with, to create, and it's now been almost a year since we put out the clean uh, electrification pathway, um, which is our view of how to get to our state's 2030 greenhouse gas goals and the, uh, the air quality reductions or improvements that we need to get across the state. And what we did in doing that was look across multiple sectors. We looked at the power sector, we looked at transportation, we looked at the building sector, and what we saw was if we're going to achieve these objectives, the most feasible and cost-effective way to do that was to look for these kinds of changes across each of the sectors. So when we think about what we've, what we've called for here, 80% uh, carbon-free uh, electricity on the grid by 2030, still very much in line with getting to 100% by 2045. Um, we, we, we believe that that's going to be a fundamental part of, wow, uh, <laughs> of having a downstream impact that achieves better and better um, uh, emissions profiles for our end uses, for transportation and for our buildings. And likewise, yes, we have a more aggressive target than the five million vehicle goal that the governor put out there. Um, and I've always been of a belief that if we say we want to get somewhere, let's push even further. Let's see where we can really go. And our, our view was when you put these components together, you had the most cost effective way of looking at this on an economy wide basis. Um, and so how can we get there? Well, 
we're seeing really good trends so far. We are seeing action kind of at all levels. So you mentioned a lot of the programs that, that LADWP has, we too, and a number of other utilities across the state looking at ways that we can help our customers get to more electrified uses uh, of, of these technologies. So in our case, we have a number of different programs, primarily on the infrastructure side to supply charging availability away from home, as well as to offer some rebates for those who install charging at home. Uh, we have to complement both of these places because to get the adoption levels to where they need to be, every one of us, including those who already drive electric vehicles or hybrids, need to have that confidence that when I go out in the world, I know I'm, my fueling is not going to be an issue for me. And I think we're seeing that begin to happen more and more and more. Even here when I came and parked in the structure today, it was very prominent to see electric vehicle stations. Now what you see is they're all full. And that's exciting, no. right? But it's a challenge That's for right. Us. And so how do I we make I hope I make sure, it home. Yeah, right. How do we make sure there's, there's more of that available? Because it's clearly being used. And so we, we look at that. We, we look beyond just the light duty sector. Well, the the $7, million, $7 million vehicle goal is probably the most prominent eye catcher in that statement. But this also has to happen in the medium and heavy duty space. It needs to happen in the off-road space. The port's doing a lot of the work that they're doing for, for cleaner uh, solutions. So we look for opportunities to partner with pilots and other types of things that can demonstrate, uh, for example, electrifying rubber gantry cranes and, and tow yard trucks uh, and so forth that, that we can prove this out and then we can scale it. But it will take action at all levels. It is not just uh, utilities trying this. It is there's consumer behavior to address. So helping people get educated, helping them understand the benefits. There are real benefits today to making switches in transportation in the overall cost of the vehicle over the long term. The the uh, frankly, I think the technology and the drive of these vehicles is tremendous. When you get people behind the wheel, they get very excited about this. But the the other very important component is how do we make this available to all of our customers. From an equity standpoint, we know that we have uh, about 45% of our customers who reside today in disadvantaged communities affected by pollution or income and both factors where they may not have accessibility to the same uh, measures today and affordability to the same measures that are available for some. And so part of the challenge in all this is making sure that what we provide uh, has that measure of equity to it, that there is accessibility for everyone who wants to take advantage of these of these technologies to get there. So again, rebate programs, opportunities, bringing the technologies into our communities and working with community groups to understand the needs that are very now and present for our, for our customers. So it's gonna take the, the, that work at all levels, technology developers, utilities, regulators, lawmakers, and so forth to get us where we need to be. Um, and I think the, 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 the greatest thing in all of this is just realizing that it is an imperative. It is something that we must do um, to avoid those kinds of almost 90 days of unacceptable consecutive days of air quality. Uh, it, it's here, it's now, 2030 is just around the corner for us, so we have to be moving forward. Great. Well, now we're going to turn to a couple of folks who are going to talk about uh, LA as a region. So uh, let, let's start with Matt, and we'll get to Chris uh, after that. Um, but Matt, uh, the Clean Tech Incubator just uh, convened and put out the first product of the Transportation Electric part, uh, Partnership, Electrification Partnership. Um, it's a partnership with local government, uh, regulators, utilities, including the two you see here today, and industry leaders. Um, so. This is really trying to address uh, the needs from a regional perspective. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what it is and, and uh, what happens next? Thank you, Nancy. And uh, of course, thank you to you and Department of Water Power support as a member of our partnership. And, and just as a little plug for not just the department, but for the La Crette's Innovation Campus and our organization, if, you've, if you haven't been down to our campus, you've got to come. It's incredible. You'll walk in, you go, this is a city facility, this is a Department of Water Power facility. It's, it's a place where innovation comes, and we try to be the front door for innovation in Los Angeles, so welcome you to come. We're blessed to be the stewards of that great resource. I uh, also want to thank board members Nancy Setley and Mary Leslie, as well as Michelle Kimmon of our staff here. We're all uh, working together. And the Transportation Electrification Partnership, we released our Zero Emissions Roadmap. Uh, you can download it as a PDF online. Uh, this, it's short, quick read. Uh, but it's packed full of ambition, and it really builds on an incredible commitment already of the mayor of Los Angeles, the county of Los Angeles, Department of Water and Power, uh, Southern California Edison, Metro, as well as our organization, to see how we can go further, faster together to get to the uh, transportation electrification targets, zero emissions, goods movement targets, 
uh, that we know we need to hit both from the long term with what the governor's is set forth, what the, the mayor set forth with this carbon neutral plan. Transportation is going to be key, let alone uh, for air quality in the lungs of, of so many here in the greater Los Angeles area. So every one of those organizations I mentioned <coughs> is part of the leadership group of this partnership. And then we have a lot of private sector partners have joined forces with us as well, like BMW and PCS Energy. Uh, uh, ITRON uh, and many other organizations including Tesla and IBEW11 and uh, so w if you're interested to learn more please go online talk to Michelle or myself uh, we're, we're eager to grow that partnership but what is what is it we're doing we in the roadmap we released um, a series of, of targets that we think we're going to need to meet to to meet the full potential of electrification of transportation but to meet those emission goals on the GHG and air quality side. So the, the punchline is we all said we're going to commit to taking additional action beyond these impressive, incredible current commitments in place and get to an additional 25% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. No small feat, but when we welcome the world to Los Angeles for the Olympics in 2028, we don't want to be the headline of, uh, to be about air quality. We don't want the headline to say California has lost its edge on fighting climate change and growing the economy at the same time. We want Los Angeles to lead by example. We have the ports of LA and Long Beach where 40% of all the goods move through for the, in the United States move through those two ports. We know it's a challenge we need to be solved. That's why we're working with the ports of LA and Long Beach as well as the Air Resources Board, the other partner I forgot to mention in our leadership group, uh, to help them. Uh, see how they can accelerate their commitments to zero emission goods movement. So we've, within that, then we have a target ranges. How many EV chargers do we need to give people the confidence to get behind the wheel of an electric vehicle? How, many, how much EV infrastructure, charging infrastructure do we need for heavy duty? Where does it need to be? Uh, and there are a lot of efforts going on that touch on pieces of this, including what Edison and DWP and CARB are doing. So really, as Mary Nichols, uh, chair of CARB, who's, who's, who's representing CARB in this partnership, says if it's, it's, it's not the kind of thing that gets us a, a headline, but the power of the partnership in of itself is pretty inc incredible to get everybody to come together and commit to targets and goals to work together, as we all can say. It wasn't easy, uh, but we got there, and now the real work's begun over the next year. We'll release 2.0 version of the roadmap that'll get into more detail about what is that 25% going to include, how do we get there, what other market signals do we need from our partners in the legislature or the mayor's office or the city council or the county board of supervisors, uh, air quality management district who's also a partner. Uh, so that's really what we're excited about, but also pilots, uh, really real time in disadvantaged communities. How can we, we're going to work in Long Beach with the support of the Knight Foundation in collaboration with everybody involved. Uh, to help uh, that city think about low, uh, the, 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 the opportunities with first mile, last mile solutions with electric scooters and EV car sharing. So there's going to be a lot to be coming out and, and startups, of course, given that's the core of our DNA, are going to be part of it as well. So we have 10 of our 35 startups are transportation related in our current portfolio. And we look forward to that increasing. Great, thanks. So, so Chris, um, the Port of LA and the Ports of LA and Long Beach are such an important economic player in the LA region, um, certainly for the nation too. And you have some pretty ambitious plans around the Clean Air Action Plan. Uh, what role is electrification playing in that and how are we doing? Well, first of all, okay, it works. Uh, <laughs> First of all, thank you to LA uh, Business Council to, in, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. It's an honor to be here. Um, we have, between the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, probably the biggest collection of emissions in the region. Um, if you think about the South Coast Air Basin and you look at where the primary amounts of emissions are coming from, you really have to see the ports as, as a major source. And as a result of that, 12 years ago, the, the ports of LA and Long Beach uh, established a Clean Air Action Plan, which she referred to. It was a, it's a comprehensive plan to reduce emissions from all the different major sources of pollution at the ports. And it was very successful. We've had 87% reduction in diesel particulate matter. That's what leads to health risk and cancer-causing problems. 98% reduction in, in sulfur oxides, 60% reduction in NOx. But it's not enough. And, and not only do we have to continue to keep reducing health risks and, and impacts to the community and in the region, we now face climate change. We've always faced it, but it's getting worse. I, I believe that climate change is the single most important environmental challenge facing the world today. 
bar, bar none. And there is absolutely no way that we can turn our back, all of us, to this problem. And at the Port of Los Angeles, we believe that we have to do our part. And so electrification and zero emissions is our goal. We've set some ambitious goals for zero emissions. We believe that all on-road trucks serving the ports should be zero emissions by 2035. We believe that all of the cargo handling equipment that operates at the port should be zero emissions by 2030. Those sounds like far away times. They're not. Um, we actually have to develop the technology and work with industry, work with people like Matt and others to help us develop uh, uh, new technologies with the, the equipment manufacturers. Um, the Port of Los Angeles is probably the toughest duty cycle, the toughest place to test heavy duty equipment. It's the biggest challenge. We have a lot of work and a lot of activities. So if equipment can work there, it can work anywhere. And the problem with zero emissions equipment right now is it costs a lot of money and it's still in the development phase. And so we see the Port of Los Angeles as a big test bed, as an opportunity to, to develop this kind of equipment, working with Matt and others to, to test that equipment. And eventually, we believe, when it becomes commercially viable, um, there is a business case for it. And once you build the business case, when the business case and the environmental case can overlap, now you've got, you've got something. Now you've got a commercially acceptable technology. You've got something that businesses can build into their marketing as being part of a green uh, a goods movement chain. You've got something that really can expand and not only exist as a niche here in Southern California, but throughout California, throughout the United States and beyond. We work with ports all over the world and they are all starting to look at things um, to address greenhouse gas and, and to address climate change. And so once you begin to build that case, then it spreads and it becomes commercially viable and something that can work around the world. So we've been pushing, we've got a Clean Air Action Plan that, that now incorporates greenhouse gas goals, um, sets these aggressive zero emission targets, and we're very, very committed, very committed to doing this, and, and we've, been, we've begun work already um, with testing this equipment, developing feasibility assessments, evaluating the state of the industry, helping to give uh, ind industry a signal as to where we think things are going, and we look forward to that continued challenge. Great, thanks. So let me, uh, sorry, Jonathan, last but not least again, uh, but um, so we, we've been talking about some of the real opportunities here and a lot of that around electrification. A lot of the um, excitement is that um, we're moving towards uh, a zero emission grid, um, but you've been a player in the zero emission uh, grid space for uh, for a long time, and talk uh, talk about how your you and your company view um, solar and storage, um, and what it means for uh, all these um, opportunities for electrification. Oh, great! Thank you. So, about 15 years ago, co-chair Ryan McEnroe, I told him that in 15, in the future, electric vehicles will will stabilize the power in the grid. And he reminded me of that just a few months ago. And I do, think we're, I do think it's still early, but we're working pretty fast to that. And, and I think in all of our lifetime, we're going to see that. Um, but backing up, Permacy is a very practical company. We run a, a solar design and construction company. We have our own solar rooftop technology as patents and its own building code. And it's allowed us to build down uh, at the port on, on what we call fairly lightweight constructed buildings. We built the largest project in the world. It's about 16 and a half megawatts. But in terms, it supplies about 5,000 homes equivalent worth of power. So what, what's important about that? Other than it created 320 direct prevailing wage jobs that made everyone in the inner city very excited, uh, and uh, that we now have a growing company led by a veteran. We're taking the veterans, we're training them, uh, we're taking inner city, and we're giving them really good paying jobs. And we like those prevailing wage jobs because it gives us an opportunity to really pay people extremely well. Um, but the infrastructure there, once, you, once you've connected the equivalent of 5,000 homes with the solar, well, you can connect equipment 5,000 homes with a battery. We've already put in the infrastructure. The infrastructure there was millions and millions of dollars. It's there. So if you think there's an infrastructure problem, well, there's not when you follow, when you follow what, we, what we do. So that's coming very fast. Um, I think LA City and DWP did, did a terrific job, and, and, and uh, congratulations to Mary and everyone who's been involved with the fit. 
I think what we did with the bundled fit is, is really open, woken everyone up. Um, I think Edison's doing a really good job with their battery program of, of, of making it available. So recently, <clears throat> in Glendale, wanted to build a, a, a power plant, and then we got this phone call from a, neighbor, a citizen group, and I'm like, they're going to put a bid in. I'm like, well, it kind of looks like one of those rig bids, <laughs> you know, like they just want to go build a $500 million power plant. Like, no, no, we, we, we told them that it, that's not acceptable. I said, okay, well, since you guys are, are, are being the thorn in their side, I'll, I'll, I'll put one in. And then since that time, I guess California now voted that by 2045, no more, no more fossil fuels. So what does that look like? Well, we, we put in, we said, well, let's do what we did in LA City, combined with what Edison's doing with batteries, and let's put that together, just a little more flexibility. And there's, there's probably over, on that one proposal, there's probably 800, and I said, if it's on public property, or let's do prevailing wage, like we did, like we did for LADWP. And let's, keep, let's put our people in the unions, let's get them benefits. And, and then I said, well, let's build a big batteries, and let's, let's because uh, Glendale can't bring any more power in from the outside. They are resource constrained. So they're either gonna build a big power plant that's probably virtually illegal, or they're gonna kinda do what the citizen group does. Well, it's kind of small. We just said do 10% what the citizen group does. We'll see what they do with the rest, probably some large batteries. So I think if that goes, we're gonna have another game changer where we can start to see how, what the mayor calls, environmental equity. Don't redo the environment without including the people that need jobs. He's been pretty, pretty clear about that. that, that that's, and, I, and of course, all of us out of sustainability buy into that. And I think what we're doing, you know, combined with people having union jobs, all the, all the training that's gone through IBEW with the battery training, when electric vehicles, I'm looking for a bi-directional inverter, because part of that proposal, we said 10% of what we build, why don't we just give senior citizens cars for their senior homes because my parents are in one the car just sits there so if you're going to have 60 kilowatt hours in a car what that just sits there why don't you back up the grid with it right no infrastructure needed so i'm really going to challenge everyone with it, what, what ryan and i talked about 15 years ago and here we are now let's start being really smart with the way we invest in infrastructure and let's not send senior citizens to the gas station when they can barely walk, right? Uh, as the case of my parents. Um, and let's get them excited. So that, and let's create the thousands of very high paying jobs. That's it. All right, thanks Jonathan. So, uh, so we'll turn to some sort of group questions, but I might, I might sort of direct them a little bit. But um, so, you know, California and LA has very ambitious goals around uh, greenhouse gas emissions, around reducing air pollution, you've heard a little bit today about the roles that buildings and, and transportation can play. And um, certainly in this conference, I think a lot of the, the morning was uh, talking about uh, affordable housing and the housing issues. And um, Assemblywoman, you, you're, you have to deal with all of these issues in, in Sacramento. So as you look forward to the, the next session with, with the new governor uh, and these, these, all these ambitious plans in place, um, how, do you, how do you think the state um, and communities can address um, affordable housing and these clean energy um, plans at the same time? Uh, that's a really good and big question. I, I would say, first of all, we have to recognize that housing and transportation are linked and that we're never going to be able to solve our housing crisis if we don't think about transportation at the same time. Because the reason people are so resistant to building any housing in Los Angeles is because of the impact on congestion and transportation. So they're, they're interlinked issues. And um, <clears throat> you know that's what you hear as the rallying cry of every community group when anybody wants to build anything in their backyard. Um, I think we need to be a lot smarter about how we build. We need to think much more comprehensively about what technologies in the future are going to offer us with autonomous vehicles, with the desire of younger people right now to move away from uh, cars and to have um, other alternatives that are more readily available. Scooters, I just saw someone getting a ticket on a scooter on the way over and I wanted to get out and yell at the police officers. Like, don't you have anything better to do right now? Um, scooters, cycling, pedestrians, making those safer and more available to people as an alternative, thinking of those as alternatives to cars, which are still predominantly fueled by gasoline. 
if we don't move people out of cars, we're never going to deal with congestion issues. I don't care how well the autonomous vehicles drive. We still can't put everyone in them at the same time. So investments in mass transit and thinking about those alternatives as ways to solve the gaps that fall between mass transit and making those investments and then building smarter so that you create cities that are not only um, uh, give the uh, amount of housing that we need, but that be offer a better quality of life because they're walkable and they're bikeable. So you can be healthier and live a, a healthier lifestyle, a lifestyle that's more social, that offers m more of what younger people and even older people like me want to have in our lives, spend less time in our cars, more time together in transit. I, I read this great tweet. It was like my favorite tweet of all time. It said something like, you know, I, I, have, I have the ultimate luxury vehicle experience every day. I go to work in a $30 million vehicle that's chauffeur driven, and I can bring 600 of my new friends. You know, and that's what it means to take mass transit to work every day. You know, if you sort of change the way people are thinking about it, offering a safer way that people can be healthy and, and walk and bike, and then put housing around all of that so that you create better planning. Um, and I would say that there is definitely a role for local governments, obviously, but also for the state, because we have to think about these issues holistically and as statewide issues, because we have a statewide housing crisis, we have a statewide transportation crisis, so we need statewide solutions, and I'm sure you heard that from Scott Wiener, who I saw on the way out, and I absolutely subscribe to that. So it all fits together in a big puzzle, and you can't, start, you can't separate any of these component parts out without considering the other parts. I don't know if that answered your question, but I didn't really understand your question, so I just thought I'd <laughs> talk about That's, Those are always the best answers. Um, help, help out the moderator who asked the, who asked the question. So, um, but I think that raises a role, I think questions about sort of the role of, of technology. And I know, Matt, when we were talking about the transportation electric, electrification partnership, there was a lot of discussion with some of the transportation planners, exactly uh, as Ms. Friedman said, you know, where if you're, doesn't matter if you're stuck in a traffic jam in an electric vehicle, you're still stuck in a traffic jam. Yeah. Um, so, what do you think the role of technology is in, in helping to solve uh, some of those problems? Well, that's a great question. And I, and I think we're seeing, and certainly from existing well known companies and agencies, we're seeing some new solutions. Yet, if we look at what we thought was exciting, when I was in the mayor's office carrying around my dog-eared copy of the Sustainable City Plan, one of the goals that we had in there was to get bike share started, right? And, and so that happened. It was great and exciting. Three years ago, now dock-based bike sharing is the old line, old school solution. Now what's the, in the last year, what's the dockless, not even just bikes, but scooters? And you've seen them around campus. You talked about somebody getting a ticket on one. Cities are struggling how to keep up with innovation, but that's where we're going to see some differences. And why, to you answer your question, Nancy, is, is a very good one, is one of the other targets we set in that sustainable city plan, which the mayor's going about to, uh, a refresh update of, is, is how do we get people out of their cars for those commutes of two miles or less? Talking about whether it's high quality transit that they have those options for, or there's a luxury option, or walking or biking. But if we can't get more services into neighborhoods to get you to walk, to get us all to walk uh, or ride our bike, then uh, we're seeing people get out of shared uh, rides, out of their Uber and Lyft, and then onto a scooter, which is exciting. So if you can do that, you don't have to carry a big bag of groceries back on your scooter. Uh, that's great. And now Uber and Lyft and others are getting into that business. Uh, we saw Lime earlier, and Bird, of course, is the, was the first one we noticed in Santa Monica. So I think that's where we're seeing startup innovations. We have a couple scooter-related startups in our portfolio now, too. Great. Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Nancy, may I, may I offer something? Uh, we talked about transportation. We talked about technology. And I wanted to share something that we've discovered in the last few years at the Port of Los Angeles. I think it's relevant here. We all get so caught up on the zero emission, the electrification vehicles, the, the equipment, that we forget about the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And our experience has been at the Port of Los Angeles that it's the infrastructure that ends up being probably the biggest hurdle to the widespread deployment of zero emissions. Yeah. That it's, it's even more of a problem than developing the equipment itself. And so what I wanted to make a plug for and, and maybe make an urge, and urge to all the good people here is 
we need to start planning not just for the equipment, but we need to plan for the introduction of zero emissions infrastructure throughout the region, throughout the state, and beyond. And, and that's no small thing, because it, the, our experience with heavy-duty equipment, and that's sort of my area, is the infrastructure to support a heavy-duty truck is about the same cost as the heavy-duty truck. And so it, you essentially end up doubling the amount of money you thought you had to spend to go with zero emissions. So I just wanted to point that out because I think that we talk about, about the equipment so much and the development of it, but we have to remember that part of our goal is to plan for and then develop and deploy the infrastructure. Great. Well, Michael, I think yeah, you might want to jump in yeah. here. If you, if you weren't, I was going to kick you. We're going to go there anyway, right? Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, and, and I think there's a few things that we can turn to to, to help move that along. Some of it is active um, uh, activity that's happening today in terms of what various utilities might be proposing to do. You know, in our case, for example, we recently got approval for a $356 million five-year program for medium and heavy-duty infrastructure deployment to support the electrification of vehicles um, across our territory. That's an important step, but to, to the point that you're making, that that is a five-year program, and we've got a, a long, long way to go even beyond that. So that's the starting point, but that's a big, big, big jump into a, a new space and balancing out the ability to get this deployed and working closely with partners to map out what their needs will be. Similarly, we now have pending in front of our, our Public Utilities Commission a light-duty infrastructure proposal over four years that's for $760 million to deploy about 48,000 charging ports across our service territory. The, the important thing about that, those numbers are big, but here's the small part of it. It only re reflects one-third of the need that we project to support this kind of electrification across our territory. So we have to look for complementary ways to help that grow. Electrify America is one place that will bring along other infrastructure and looking for other places where it can help to take off. But I think we also have some good opportunities to leverage um, legislation that was recently passed on the statewide level. It's asking the CEC to take a good statewide look at the deployment of, of charging infrastructure and how it's keeping up with the governor's objectives. And so that will give us uh, you know, kind of a centralized place to look. And then you look at other things like regional activities, like what Matt is leading with the electrification partnership we have. And a, a big rung of, of that effort is the infrastructure component and the alignment of the energy uh, grid and this technology. So couldn't agree more. And, and the, one of the things that we also need to look for, how can we streamline the, uh, the, the implementation of this? Because what we do find is that oftentimes, for a lot of very good reasons, there is a, there's a process that's uh, underway at uh, any regulatory body or oversight that takes quite a bit of time. It can take, on average, 18 to 24 months to get an application approved. And so we're now two years down the road of where we need to be by the time we're even getting started. So I think that's another part of all of this, is looking for ways that we can come together to figure out how do we streamline approval processes appropriately and responsibly, but in a way that can allow us to make steps forward, leaps forward, and keep things moving in the market. Well, when we look at the building front, uh, one of the new um, policies uh, the California Energy Commission recently adopted was around uh, making uh, new buildings over three stories uh, have solar. So, Jonathan, um, what does that mean for, uh, for your company? What does it mean for uh, consumers? What do you think that means uh, for the housing market generally? Well, I, I've always thought that um, solar, like low flush toilets, should be mandated. Um, you know, my thoughts are that we should build 60% of solar in basin, although 20% is probably more realistic given the, given the complexity. Um, I think it's real exciting. I mean, we, we, we were forced to create our own technology that's very, very easy to deploy. We have a partnership with the largest roof manufacturer in the world that will, will guarantee the roof. 30 years with it. Um, we are training people to do it, and so, and we have we have very large manufacturing capacity here in Los Angeles. So, something like that will just create a lot of jobs. They'll take a technology like ours. Um, I mean, Perma City. We've seen thousands of people come through Perma City. They've started their own solar companies of, of various sizes. Um, it, it it creates a lot of jobs. So that that type of uh, 
I mean, that type of mandate can, can only be very, very helpful and lead to a lot, lead to integration of the transportation of what Matt's working on. Mm -hmm. So, highly encourage. Just saying that at, at Altus, we're, we're real excited to be doing Altus C, which isn't, isn't a multifamily, although we, we, we've, we've sold our technology to people who have done multifamily, but in that we would like to roll out, a, the infrastructure could support um, maybe up to 200 electric car chargers. And as we think about the new driverless vehicles, we see the shared cars that you're working on, and, I, and we talk about cars backing up the grid, you got 200 spaces with an infrastructure which is 10 megawatt hours. That's a lot, a lot of power that could immediately go to the grid. So, so Chris, you're kind of sitting on a, on a gold mine down there in terms of what's going on. And, it's, and Nancy, it's just very exciting. So thanks. Great. Well, maybe um, we've, we've got uh, about 10 minutes left. So let me um, toss uh, a couple of questions out to the group. I th a couple of you alluded to um, sort of uh, the opportunity for workforce development and jobs. Um, so let me just throw that out there and see uh, what you all think about um, how, uh, how this trend towards electrifying our, our vehicles and our buildings, uh, what does that mean for jobs in the region um, and maybe throw in just technology development more generally? I don't know who wants to start. So I, I can hop in there. I think there's a number of studies out there that are illustrating that the, the, the clean technology sector generates quite a bit of, of new jobs um, as the development comes along, whether it's infrastructure development, uh, technology development, or simply a matter of in, you know, inventing, developing, and creation of, of new pieces of uh, potential solutions. What's important in this, too, is thinking about where the jobs will be. And so, as I mentioned earlier, when we think about the deployment of, of the, the solution across our state, um, it's important that we are really looking for um, the, the, the right kinds of programs that can bring the technologies and the, the clean air solutions into each of our communities and offer opportunities for more and more people to get involved in the change. Um, a, a big part of that too is education and how our, our next workforce is being developed and prepared. Um, so at our company, for example, um, we sponsor uh, over a million dollars every year in scholarships in STEM. Uh, education across our service territory. It's one of the, the my most fun things to be a part of is to see uh, a lot of these students who we can bring along, many of whom are going to college for the first time, uh, get these scholarships and grants and opportunities and how excited they get about getting into the field because they see the openness and the possibilities. But the sooner we begin ensuring that we've, we've offered the educational platforms and understanding of what's coming and how these things will shift and change, then the workforce gets prepared and we bring along the new opportunities for others. I'll, I'll just add, uh, I think there is a lot of exciting opportunities. I just met with the president of, of a company called Change, C-H-A-N-J-E. They're, they're going to make uh, electric trucks, basically, here in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, they are uh, looking for 200 employees for their factory, basically. And so there's, there's a growing demand as we see more mobility companies not just come here and assemble vehicles like BYD in the county as well as New Flyer, but actually manufacture from the ground up. Uh, and that's very exciting. I know Metro has a desire to see the rail car industry return to Los Angeles County as well. So how do we work together to create those market signals, create those incentives to encourage businesses to want to be here, and we're seeing it happen, along with preparing that workforce. And we, we're going to be doing a lot more as an organization of workforce development integrated into the partnership we've described. We're represented in the state legislature currently by Miguel Santiago and Kevin DeLeon, and they advocated for a $2 million earmark for the organization to do pilots in disadvantaged communities and to do workforce development. And transportation will be a big focus of that. And we're going to have to work in partnership with entities like IBW11 and NECA as they train their members and their apprentices on how to install EV charging infrastructure. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity there, I think, to unpack uh, as we move forward. I guess I would add to that. Just, I really think it's important as part of what we're doing here to have um, strategic transportation planning, um, not just to address the issues that I raised about, you know, where are we going to put all this infrastructure? It's going to cost a fortune, so where's the money going to come from? How should we prioritize the infrastructure? But also, what are the emerging industries? And how are there opportunities for jobs? And how can we train people 
to be prepared for where things are going to have to go to address these very serious problems that we all realize are going to have to be addressed. And so I think part of what is needed, and I think it's happening, but I think it needs to be, to be even stronger and more, more um, effort behind it, is transportation planning, strategic transportation planning. Where are we going? What are the major, for, I'm the goods movement person, so where are the major goods movement corridors? Um, how are we going to plan to have those corridors uh, you know, set up with infrastructure? Um, what kind of industries, what kind of businesses are going to emerge and going to be able to be needed to support that? Um, you talked about uh, solar power. He's right. By the way, you gave your shameless plug about your, your building. Ours is fully solar powered as well, yep. as, is, <laughs> as, is, as is our cruise terminal. It's the first cruise terminal that's fully solar powered. Um, that's my shameless plug. But part of the, uh, part of the, the goal that we need to, to, to have as part of this transportation planning is jobs and job training. And, and I think that's critical. So we're excited by that. Right now, our, uh, our Perma City Empower that's led by Commander Jeremy, uh, who was the, who's leading our construction recruiting vets, they're up to uh, 50, 50 people right now. They'll grow to 100. Although, at, from the unions, we have 30,000 people to draw from in the unions in LA. They want to go to work. So I think it's exciting that, 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 that the people of LA, through this change, will get the jobs that are needed to pay the high rents we talked about this morning and to get people closer to home. So I think it's an exciting time that I think we're leading the country in that. Great. Well, I think we are uh, close to wrapping up here, but I wanted to uh, just to give everybody an opportunity to uh, offer some uh, prognostication. Uh, so uh, November will be here before we know it, and, uh, and California will have a governor, new, new governor before we know it. and. And the legislature is going to get back to work in January, uh, well, December and then January. Uh, so what do you all see uh, is coming next uh, in these areas? Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Ms. Friedman. You started with me first last time. Just down there. <laughs> we can mix it up. Well, no, I'll, I'll just say um, I don't really know what's coming next. Um, I will say I'll get political for a second since you talked about November and the election that uh, what we do in California is important far beyond the amount of emissions that California is responsible for, which is something like two and a half percent of the world's emissions. People say, why are we going to go out and sort of suffer or be in front or be the early adapter? You know, why don't we go and make China you know, be the leader? And I believe that it's really, really important that California lead the way. And not, um, not even so much for that 3% of emissions worldwide, but because, number one, we want to be the world leader, right? We want to be the world leader in innovation and technology and transportation and uh, creativity and all of the things that are our economic capital in the world. And California is important worldwide because we deliver so many things to the whole planet. We deliver the new technology, the internet, um, the transportation solutions, what we're doing with clean energy. And if you think it's not impressive, it is. I, last year, I was very honored to be, have been selected to go to Germany to the COP, which is the conference of parties that were the Paris Accord group. So there were all these nations around the world. Now, Trump decided not to participate. So the US did not have a place in the pavilion of all of the, the nations of the world. He did send some coal people over to speak on behalf of the US, which was really embarrassing. But I will tell you that even though we're only a state, California was sought after by many countries to sit down with, including China uh, and Brazil and lots of other places. And what we heard from places like, like Germany when they met with us was, how did you do it? Because in Germany and in Europe, they're on coal and they're on nuclear almost exclusively. Now, there's some countries like Spain that have done better, but they want to know how we did it so they can copy us. So if we have California companies, of course, developing that technology, we open this huge market around the world. But I think even beyond that, getting back to the election, the reason that Trump is trying to lower our fuel standards and bring more coal into the world is because he wants to show the rest of the country that California, with our democratic you know, leanings, are failures. So if we fail in what we're doing here, we just give a greater you know, urgency to the Trump agenda, which to me is against everything that my values stand for. 
um, you know, being things like having a planet for my daughter to inhabit in 30 years, which is a core value for me, uh, but you know, not for the, the federal government right now. So we have to succeed. So what we do goes way beyond that 3%. And it's not only important for that, but also because it's going to power our economy the way that it's powering our economy now. So if you want to be selfish about it, you can be selfish for that. Now, the wildfires that happened this year should have been a wake-up call for everyone. Because I don't care if you live in Montecito or Shasta, or Shasta we are all going to pay for that. We're all, going to, we're all going to be paying financially. So you asked a question earlier about how can we afford this. We can't not afford to fight climate change because every, every wildfire is a bigger impact than anything you can spend on, a, on an elect, a flash water heater for your home. So I will just end with a call to arms and urgency and, you know, and all of that. Um, so it really is, you know, to be all hands on deck. All right. So so the gauntlet has been thrown down. So we'll just move down the uh, the, the the dice here. Uh, Michael, what's, like what's Southern California Edison yeah, exactly. going to do to help that? California maintain its rock star status? Well, I, I think it, I think it is, is exactly that. It is taking what we have built and saying it's not enough, that we have to continue this trajectory and accelerate it. We, we, we just must. There are things like uh, you know, the regional collaboration that, that now says, all right, 2030, let's move to 2028. Um, when we look at things, the, the, the trajectory we have made, we've achieved reductions in the power sector faster than they were called for. So we've shown that we can do these things. The emissions reductions will happen. People will, will come alongside a, a, a call to action, an important one, and say, I can do that. I can figure that out. We have so much of that ingenuity here. And it comes from everywhere. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that I see that, that kind of innovation ingenuity, even in the electric utility. I know that's shocking, but it's true. There are people working really, really hard to say, we can play a part in this and make it go. So I think for the state, it's going to be about not only what, do, what does our government uh, help us to propel forward to do, but what, do we, what mantles do we take up and move forward with? So whether it's, you know, however your business or your organization can contribute to that, that's what we have to be looking at is saying, it's no longer a matter of, are we doing this? No, we're doing this. We are going to meet this challenge and we can do it in really creative and thoughtful ways when we look to harness the best of what each of us can produce. So I think that's what we have to be looking forward is, how do we take what we've got and continue to push it forward? So Chris, uh, at ports around the world, look at, look at LA and Long Beach, and so how are we gonna keep up our rock star status? <laughs> I, I think you'll see a couple things. I think you'll see our terminals really uh, start to step up and demonstrate some leadership in the movement toward reduce, reducing emissions. There are some exciting things that are happening that I can't speak of at this moment, but in the next two, three years, mm -hmm. you'll see some pretty big steps happening with our uh, cargo handling equipment and our cargo terminals uh, that are pretty exciting. Um, but even going beyond that, I, I think probably one of the exciting things that I believe is going to happen, and it's not just with the ports, but um, with the cities along the west coast here, is you're going to see a collaboration of cities and ports and organizations start to, to purchase zero emissions equipment collectively um, to establish a market that goes beyond just individual operations. And the manufacturers will be able to see that zero emissions is important to wide range of people throughout this region. And I think that, that, that effort, collective effort of, of ports and cities here on the West Coast will provide some leadership around the world. Great. Well, uh, if I just one more minute uh, to give our, our uh, last two panelists uh, the last word here. I'm going to start with Jonathan. Jonathan, real quick, rock star, how are we going to do that? We're just going to keep working with all of you great people in uh, government institutions to uh, keep doing what we're doing, and we'll, we'll get there. Great. Well, Matt, you get the last word. OK, great. Thank you, Nancy. No pressure. No pressure. Um, you know, I think we're going to continue LA, LA and California's leadership. There's no choice, uh, as assembly member pointed out, and uh, that's exciting. Uh, and I think we're going to, in locally, we're going to do some things to think about. All right, so the gas station is one of our greatest known land uses here in Los Angeles, along with traffic. Uh, and how do we repurpose those? What are they going to look like in the future? 
So there's going to be a design competition we're going to do with the mayor's office and Christopher Hawthorne uh, to figure that out and ask the world to think about how does L.A. change that paradigm. Uh, and then you think about the statewide leadership with the new governor and Mary Nichols staying on as board chair at CARB. There's so much I think we can double down on. How do we move uh, some startup dollars from CARB into uh, transportation-related startups to get more innovation going, as CEC has done, into the energy sector? Uh, and then... I think because of LA, our Mayor Garcetti and others' leadership of, uh, of with cities across the country, that LA, California spirit is going to be imbued in cities across the nation as climate mayors, uh, the group of over 400 mayors that, uh, that Mayor Garcetti started, is going to continue to help make sure we've got bastions of leadership throughout this great nation. Well, thanks. I'm, and I'm all for a redesigned gas stations as long as they still have bad coffee. And with that, uh, <laughs> let me thank the rest of the, our great panel for a fun discussion. And thank you all very much. We did two solar powered gas stations. Did you? Good afternoon. I am Dwight Alexander, Vice President of Legislative Affairs for the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco. And you're thinking, Federal Home Loan Bank. Well, we're not federal. We don't do home loans, and we don't take deposits. But we are probably the biggest bank that you've never heard of. Um, the Federal Home Loan Bank is part of a system of 11 banks, um, the San Francisco Bank, covers the financial institutions in California, Arizona, and Nevada, about 332 uh, banks, credit unions, insurance companies, community development financial institutions, and we provide liquidity to them to the tune of just shy of $3 trillion annually in short and long-term liquidity. Um, as part of the mission of the federal home loan banks, we give 10% of our profits in grants to affordable housing. Those of you who do affordable housing know about the AHP program. Um, and last year, the San Francisco Bank reached a milestone in that we delivered our one billionth dollar um, in affordable housing grants um, over the 28-year uh, life of the program. Roughly $35 million a year. In 2018, the bank has given away $66 million in grants. About 14, 14 million of that went to Los Angeles in Los Angeles counties. Um, all of that has produced 26,000 rental units in Los Angeles and 970 ownership units. Um, but across the system, the 11 banks have given $5 billion in grants to affordable housing. One of every four Habitat for Humanity dollars comes from the federal home loan banks. So that's, that's the part that you didn't know. But one of the things we did in San Francisco is we realized that even that $5 billion and the $1 billion that we've done in our three-state region is not enough, is we tried to do something innovative. Um, we created what we call the Quality Jobs Fund. Uh, along with the New World Foundation, we gave them $100 million to really look at funding, you know, sort of small businesses that have shown the ability to create jobs and to create living wage jobs, what we call quality jobs, as well as investing in training groups that can, at the end of the day, say, I've trained you and I have a job for you. That's a quality job. And so if you want to know more about the Quality Jobs Fund, go to qualityjobsfund.org, and it can tell you how to get involved, how you can apply to get funds out of the Quality Jobs Fund. But let me turn my attention now to something that's more important and uh, what I was really actually sent up here to do. <laughs> I had to give my commercial. Um, I want to introduce you to someone who you already know. I don't need to look at my notes for this because he has been a tireless fighter. Um, and starting from humble beginnings, he sort of the, carried the lessons in life that he learned from his parents who worked hard every day um, to his own life message of working hard every day. 
and not forgetting where he came from. In, in my world, I kind of say, you know, when you get somewhere and you do something good, you leave the ladder down for somebody else. He's the leave the ladder down guy. He's the guy who cares about his community, cares about California. You know, people say I'm a lover, not a fighter. He's a lover of California. He's a fighter for California. You know, there's that one kid when you were in grade school that everybody wanted that boy or girl on their team. Well, this is the guy I want on my team and any team that I pick, uh, the Honorable Javier Becerra, my friend and our Attorney General. Dwight, I think you got that line, uh, lover not a fighter, from a guy in Washington, D.C. who's trying to get confirmation these days, but um, I, I had to. I had to. I just had to. It's, uh, it's, it's, I, we heard some sad news today about how the vote is going, so at least from my perspective. So, I want to thank Dwight for the introduction. As usual, uh, I saw Nadine. I was with Nadine. And, Mary Leslie there, the, the two power brokers who do this every time. Uh, I would just want to congratulate Mary Leslie and Nadine Watt for the work that they do with LABC and for once again putting on a great conference. I understand that you have solved the housing crisis uh, and we're ready to go. Uh, I wanted to share some news and I was asked to focus a bit on what we're doing when it comes to clean jobs and clean energy uh, because Half of the 44 lawsuits we filed against the federal government are in the environmental space. But I have to actually lead with the news that I just got from my legal team about an hour ago that we just uh, won again against the federal government, this time in their efforts to try to deny us the ability to get funding grants for our law enforcement agencies because they don't like the way we don't do their immigration enforcement and deportation for them. We just got a decision from a federal court judge that has completely blocked their efforts to deny us funds. Not only that, but they held unconstitutional the, the federal statute that they were using to try to deny us those funds. So in every single way, it's sort of like the Dodgers. We just won 6-0 on this one. And so um, I, 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 I sort of had a lead with that. Look, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I, I know I stand between you and that great traffic on the freeways. Uh, and so this is what I'd like to just simply say to you. Um, when you give a kid a chance to open a door, as Dwight said, and see things that he or she had never understood, and then you actually let them play with the toys that are in there, some great things can happen. And who would have said that a, a construction worker with a sixth grade education who married a woman when she was 18 and brought her from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico here, would have a chance to raise four kids. And even though they never had got a chance to step on a college campus in their life until their son had a chance to go to college, here they are today watching as the 33rd Attorney General for the state of California is kicking the behind out of the guy in Washington, D.C. who wants to stop California from doing what it has done to make it number one. And so I will tell you, it is a thrill to be able to stand here and tell you that you should never believe that you should throttle back what you believe is the right thing to do. If you believe it, then do it. Yeah. And, and I believe California has that written all over. Our fingerprints on, are on that statement to the nth degree. Because you see, California really is not just a state. California is a state of being. California doesn't just say we're going to lead. California leads. California doesn't just say we're going to change the way we do business. We changed the way America does business. And you know what happens when you do that? When you, when you throttle up, when you challenge, and when you don't take no for an answer, especially since you didn't know that that's what you should expect, you become the economic engine for the rest of the country. You nudge Great Britain aside and you become the fifth largest economy in the world. You create more jobs than any other state in the nation. And you become number one in so many different ways that people don't expect. Why should we stop that? 
And so every time someone wants to put up a challenge to us, whether it's from abroad or whether it's from Washington, D.C., you better have a good explanation of why California should stop doing what it's doing. Otherwise, we're going to keep blazing because those trails have opened the doors for a lot of kids who had never gone to college, for a lot of families who never could believe that they could do well and prosper, and for a lot of America that is going to follow the path of California, they may not believe it, in the generation to come. And so here in L.A., I think we know that as well as anyone. Think about it. Like Einstein, we measure distance in time. You know, uh, we become the clean jobs capital of America, some 162,000 jobs strong. We do what we do not because it's easy or it feels good, but because we must. That's what it takes to be number one. Remember, it wasn't always that way. We came out of the 80s. Remember the peace dividend after the Cold War ended? Talk to the folks in the aerospace industry and how we were in that death spiral seeing all those jobs leave California and here, Southern California. I'll take you back 24 years. Remember Prop 187, the most anti-immigrant initiative we had seen in the history of the country before the voters, which passed in California by nearly 60%. 10 years ago, Prop 8, which try to dictate, have government dictate who you could marry. It wasn't that long ago. We were having some struggles as well. But we've overcome those things. Today, we don't just do green jobs. We do them with project labor agreements so that the men and women who do the work in those projects are getting paid a fair wage. And that's why all of a sudden, you can see some folks like my parents have an opportunity to prosper. So when we say we're number one, we mean it. I already told you, clean energy jobs, number one. Manufacturing, number one. Agriculture, number one. Dairy, not Wisconsin, California, number one. Entertainment, tourism, technology, you know it, number one. College graduates, nobody does it better. Exports, California, number one. What are our just so you see how things have changed, what are our top exports out of California? Think about it. You can, you, we still have some of that aerospace industry, so it should not surprise you that we still do fairly well when it comes to some of those things like uh, aircraft engines. That's number one in the state. Machines for semiconductor manufacturing, number two. What's number three? Diamonds. Diamonds. For non-industrial use. Not for those saw blades. For those, well, at least if it's real, on those rings, on those fingers. Diamonds. What's number four? Wireless switches for phones. Number five. Electronic integrated circuits. Number six. Almost sold. Almonds. <laughs> Almonds. Number seven. This is California, folks. Number seven. Electric vehicles. Okay. Electric vehicles. Friends, we didn't, we didn't get to where we are by excluding people as we saw with Prop 187 back in 1994, we abandoned Prop 187 in California. And today, in 2018, California stepped up, took on President Trump, we, who wanted to abandon our dreamers in the state of California. And we stopped Donald Trump from eliminating the DACA program. And so today, those 800,000 dreamers throughout this country who are working, going to school, living outside of the shadows are there because California said, we're not living in the past with Prop 187. In California, I say this with pride, it's not about where you're from. You could be from Indiana or India, Michigan or Michoacan. And it makes no difference. In California, it's about how hard you work, not where you're from. So 
It should not surprise you then that we don't pursue the policies of the past. We're not interested in going back to those days that some people say were great. At least I remember when my parents would tell me that it wasn't so great when they saw the signs outside those establishments that used to say, no dogs, Negroes, or Mexicans allowed. Those weren't such great days for some of us. We don't go back to those days. We try to include people here in California. And so on climate, California's leadership is unsurpassed. We have the toughest, most stringent requirements. And at the same time, yes, we can walk and chew gum. We have more jobs for more people in that industry than anyone else. We've added more than 3 million jobs in the last eight years here in the state of California. That's more than any other state. And there are more than a half a million people in California today who are working in those clean energy jobs. That's almost 10 times the number of Americans working in clean energy jobs than there are Americans working in the coal mining industry. And California does all of this while we follow the rules and the regulations. And that isn't always easy. I know you can attest to that. But even so, even so, in the last seven years, California's manufacturing output in those seven years has grown 26%. Texas, which likes to get on our case about our rules, Texas's manufacturing output shrank 1% in that same period. And we do it by the rules. So make no mistake, we do a lot. We blaze trails. But we still know that we have a lot of work to do. That's what this conference was about, right? We want to make sure that those who are working hard can actually find a place to live. We want to make sure that everyone can keep their health insurance. And not all Californians, we know, are getting to share in our state's progress and that prosperity. We have more than two million people in our state who are working today and living in poverty. The highest poverty rate among working adults in our state, right here in our county of LA, 16%. So we know we have to make those infrastructure investments that you talked about today. We know we have to figure out how to do it in a different way by jumping out of the box and figuring out what will work for everyone. But I'll tell you right now, the most important investment you and I and all of us, private and public se sector can make, and I know you know this, but it has to be repeated. That capital that we have to invest in is our human capital. Remember this, within five years of graduating from a place like UCLA, the majority of low-income students who go to a UCLA or any other UC campus, within five years, they're, they're already out earning their parents because they went to university. But remember this as well. You take that 17-year-old and don't have him come to UCLA, and he happens to find himself in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing, and you have to incarcerate him to keep him incarcerated for that one year as a 17-year-old, you are paying the same amount you would have paid to have him go to college at UCLA for four years and then paid for his way to go to graduate school for another four years for the one year that you keep him incarcerated when he's 17 years of age. And so the most important investment we can make in our infrastructure is in our human capital. And so I say to all of you as innovators, as folks who are working hard to change the dynamics so that there are jobs for any, everyone and we're all prospering from what the economy in California does for so many, don't stop. Do what the dreamers say they do. Their slogan is they are undocumented and unafraid. All of us don't have to worry about it being asked for our papers. We should be, like the dreamers, 
unbowed and unafraid in everything we do because no one does it like California. So I urge you, I urge you to understand that we are setting the trend for the country and even the naysayers out there who think California is just too different are going to end up doing what we're doing right now. The sooner, the better from my perspective. And so be unbowed, be unafraid. And if you do that, I say to you with full confidence that the 33rd Attorney General for the great state of California will have your back. It's up to us. Don't stop. Be unbowed and unafraid. Keep California number one. Thank you for what you do. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all, and that's the end of our, our program today. For any of you who missed any of the panels or any of the keynotes, go to our website and you can pick up the live stream. Thank you. <laughs>